Uh, I'm Michael Poole. I uh, work for the University of Lincoln. Uh, specifically, I work for our Faculty of Art, Architecture and Design. Um, and uh, I'm going to try and give a summary of some of the creative technologies that we've used uh, that have helped uh, enable businesses um, or some of our own research interests to progress, to generate profit, to, to have some kind of end result. Um, but hopefully, with this summary of sort of the various technologies here, you can see how that may be able to impact your business, how it may be able to drive some new opportunities, uh, reduce costs, uh, access new markets, etc., etc. But hopefully, that will become apparent. My own background is that I work within our faculty as a business development manager. Um, my, my role could be summed up uh, insofar as that I try to enable uh, profitable collaborations. Profitable collaborations between our academics and between industry. Um, profitable that it will underpin our core business, teaching and research, and profitable for business so that they can generate more revenue. But that's my particular role, working with academics to work with business, to work with business, to work with our academics. I'm an industrial designer by background, so I've spent as many years in industry working in R&D as I have in academia, and I'm responsible for a number of products that are in, in production in one form or another. Um, I have a particular expertise because I'm a 3D designer in CAD and rapid prototyping, and um, we've been responsible for one or two initiatives in the university to support various industries, the creative industries and the heritage industries. So that's my quick uh, uh, resume of my, my CV. In terms of our faculty, um, we do have a lot of expertise within design, within architecture. Um, we do a lot in terms of sustainable architecture, um, uh, design and technologies. Um, we do a lot of urban planning, we do a lot of work with uh, low carbon uh, calculation. We've got various design expertise, which includes CAD, product design, product development, product design management. And our facilities include rapid prototyping, 3D printing, laser cutting, scanning, etc. So we've got quite a, a broad range of expertise. We're trying to focus in on today. I think one of the things I wanted to try and sum up is that, or to try and summarise with this particular slide, is that as far as the 3D um, technologies go, or as far as designing new products, um, giving physical form and shape to them, the, the product design and development process is undergoing a, a rapid change. It's becoming digitised uh, a lot more. There are a lot more digital tools to help us design products, to visualise products, to create concepts quickly and to simulate production and to get them into the marketplace. And I've put down here, in some respects, I've put down input tools like 3D scanning, which you'll, you'll see examples of outside. Um, there's lots of input tools to try and capture existing shape or form that you might want to manipulate and do things with. And then we've got a range of software tools that allow you to create either just basic shape or form, or you could do uh, full testing on it in terms of testing mechanisms, animating mechanisms, checking for form and fit. Um, you could do more complex things like computational fluid dynamics or finite element analysis. But effectively, within the computer environment, you can simulate a design, you can test it, and you can increasingly prove that that design will work before you have to commit to expensive tooling. And then we've got the output tools, the hardware tools, rapid prototyping, um, although I'm going to try and escape the word rapid prototyping in a moment, um, and the various forms that rapid prototyping comes in, um, rapid tooling, rapid manufacturing, but tools that allow you to print a three-dimensional shape quite quickly. Um, I'll move on. Um, I've said that I don't want to use the word rapid prototyping. It's been around for, for quite some time, or other words that rapid prototyping uh, that we've used as things like stereolithography uh, or 3D printing, 3D concept modelling. But essentially, um, one of the terms that seems to be sticking at the moment, which is, which is a lovely term, which trips up the tongue, is additive layer manufacturing. Um, I'm not going to try and explain the process too, too much here. I think it will become apparent. But it, it's essentially to take an object that you've designed in the computer environment, you've got it on the computer screen, and it's sliced into lots of layers. And the 3D printer rebuilds this component layer by layer. That's what a lot of these particular technologies do. And they'll do it by projecting a laser beam onto a resin that cures, and then more resin is washed over the top of it, the laser beam cures that resin, 
or it's done in the case of this particular machine that we've got, this is the, the Z-Corp machine, where it, it scrapes a layer of powder over a table, it jets print the slice, then more powder is um, wiped over, the inkjet, inkjet print another slice, and gradually you print out a three-dimensional object. But why is this process so so um, well revolutionary in terms of how we make objects? Because it is quite revolutionary. It's revolutionary um, in terms of since, since the dawn of time, since we've, we've made objects, we've made objects typically through two processes, either by taking a block of material and taking material from it, a subtractive process, or by a forming process where we might get a ceramic slip and pour it into a mould to create an object, or we get a, a plastic, a polymer, and we inject it under pressure into some very expensive tooling, injection moulding. But then in the 70s, a guy patented the, the additive layer manufacturing process, and the first commercial machine appeared in about 1986 that makes an object through, through a layering process. So the fundamental shift is that essentially we can take computer data and grow objects. We can grow an object in the machine. And that has lots more benefits for how we design and make products. So for example, a very simple adjustable spanner, a very useful plastic spanner. Three moving parts on here. This was produced on the machine in one go. Okay, it's not been assembled, it was grown in the machine and it can produce a component in one go. Also, there's no tooling behind here either. Um, so I don't need lots of expensive capital to... Do you want to come in, sort of, please? So, this new way of making a component, appearing in the 80s and gathering momentum in the mid, late 90s and certainly through the noughties, is that we can effectively grow a component without tooling, we can minimise uh, the assembly of it, uh, and it's, it's all done digitally. We can exchange the information digitally over the internet. I can send a design. Um, we, we work on a number of uh, components where we talk to colleagues in the States. We regularly have conference calls with colleagues in the States, and we can design components online with them and we can check and verify components online and, and then once we're ready with our CAD package we can go file, print. It's pretty much that, that type of direction that we're going in. So we are now getting to a point where we can grow objects where this, there's a similarity here to how the human body works. We take a DNA code and we grow, grow biological structures such as ourselves. We are now taking computer code and growing objects through building objects up through a series of layers, okay? But to keep illustrating the importance of, of the flexibility this process gives us, I've, I've got a few examples here. Uh, over here, in the top right-hand corner, this process, we've got a component here that's, that's traditionally made up of a number of components, whereas this particular component here is made in a single piece. We can produce complex geometry by growing components, um, where, as, where in the previous situation we've had to use expensive tooling to create that component. Here, we've got a little dish here, designed by um, a Dutch design uh, um, company, Freedom of Creation, where if you look at this, this geometry that they've got in here, it's very difficult to make that through conventional processes. Or, we've, we've got a little iPad back here, and it's made out of a chain link. It's all made in one go. It's not been, a thread has been woven and then it's knitted. It's made in one go. Um, and this, this one I've got here, which I'll show you later on, it's a folding stool. It's made by a company in Belgium, MGX Materialize. It's made in one go. And it's got complex folding mechanisms on there, but it's manufactured in one go. And it's manufactured by designing it on a computer, testing it and simulating it on a computer. Will the mechanism work? and then it's file, print. I'm simplifying the process a little bit, but that's the direction that the manufacture of objects is going in. And I'm not using the word rapid prototyping because increasingly companies are designing an object on the computer, they test it, they verify it, 
file off prints, take it off the machine, strap it to a racing car and race it competitively. So they're producing end components. That's some fun to find out. So in terms of the, the kind of machines that are out there, um, these are the two machines that, that, that we've got. We've got the Z-Corp 3D uh, full colour powder printer, um, which some objects are outside on display there. We've got a, a machine here that makes things in um, an ABS plastic. Again, this one's got a thread on it. Uh, I'll pass these around. Um, and again, you can feel when I pass them out, you can feel the little layers on this one. They're quarter of a millimetre thick. Um, but we can, with some machines, particularly um, these machines here, more high-end machines, you can get down to microns, where it's difficult to detect the layers by the human eye. And that's when you get into the realms of producing parts that you can use in, in, in production. Um, so we've got a full range of machines here, to so sort of entry-level professional machines right through up to um, machines that will cost you a good six figures, or um, you could go online and you can get yourself a home DIY, build yourself 3D printer from a company called Thingamatic in the States. Um, they work in partnership with Bristol University that make a machine called RepRap. You can go online, download the full set of instructions, the software to run the machine, they'll send you a bill of materials and when you can get all the kit, and you can actually build yourself a home 3D printer for about a thousand pounds. More recently, um, this machine has been launched in the top corner there, called Cubify. Um, I think they're starting to take orders, but they're trying to make 3D printing in the home a lot more accessible. Um, uh, they're, they're trying to um, give you a simple design tools to create simple shapes to allow you to produce some simple, some simple shapes here. And I think on here what they've got are things like biscuit cutters, um, or you could take a picture of yourself and develop that using some of the, the apps to create a 3D shape and use a home 3D printer to make some something for a relative or something. Uh, I think one of the examples they've got is of a, of a little kid sending a, their, their grandma a picture of themselves with made at home or whatever it was. But, but that, that, that's a recent innovation that was, was launched earlier this year. But how do we use um, 3D printing? How do we use additive layer manufacturing? Well, across a broad spectrum of industries. Um, engineering like it because <coughs> this here is a, a, a component here that's got all, all the colours on. Um, some of you might know that they're trying to stress test it. And normally you can only read a stress map on a computer screen. Well, we can create a three dimensional component now that you could pass around the boardroom and sh show people to explain the problem more succinctly. Engineers like to colour coordinate components. Again, they've probably got to communicate the problem to a financial director to say, I need you to invest in some new tooling here, and this is the problem. And a lot of people that aren't used to reading drawings or three dimensional objects might find it difficult to understand. So they become excellent communication pieces. Or garden sprinkler, suspension unit here, you can produce some prototypes here for some functional testing. Um, these knives that are commercially produced in Germany, their handles are made by additive layer manufacturing, or our architects love it for, for urban planning. Um, you can make some tooling with it if you want to. You can either make the end tool or the pattern to create the tool. Um, certainly the Z-Core machine um, has been popular with the foundry industry. Um, Adidas and Nike and lots of the fashion industries use it to making trainers where the soles will flex um, and you can add colour to it. So you can very quickly show a customer and get some feedback without committing to lots of expensive tooling. She's in medical applications, uh, and obviously the jewellery sector are, are beginning to um, take off in using this technology. So a broad number of industries using it for a broad number of purposes. Um, the other thing, however, is uh, that I wanted to point out is that um, it's going to change the way we manufacture things. It's going to change the way we do business. If you think back to um, the mid-90s, uh, 10, 15 years ago, when you think about what's happened to the music industry, because you could download music, well, to some extent, that's going to happen with physical artifacts. So at home now, we've all got access where we can download virtual products, information, uh, books, uh, music, things that we can't touch. But now you are beginning to see the introduction of home 3D printers. 
And I remember an article in the paper uh, some years ago where they'd got a, a picture of a printer and coming out, out of it was an iPod, thinking, well, this is so many years down the line. Well, with the conferences that we go to, we know now that, that they're looking at 3D printers to produce biological materials. We know that they're looking at 3D printers to produce some electrical components. So the idea of being able to not only download your music, but to download it onto a player to make sure that all your particular music tracks are in on that particular object is not. It's being considered, it's being looked at. And certainly with the 3D printers that you get, get now, you could go online, you could go to a store to buy um, a small piece of jewellery or a little knick-knack that does something, and it is possible today to, um, to produce that at home. It is possible to use your printer to produce 3D products. Um, so for example, uh, the, these are examples of where this is happening. In the top one there, this is a company called Duke Jobs, where you can go online, use some very simple design tools to create a picture frame in this case. They'll print it out in their uh, facility, I think it's in Hong Kong in this case, and then they'll post it to you. We've got land print here. But if you stick in certain geographical data of where you are, it will produce a three-dimensional product of, of a given terrain. Um, uh, this is an example of one, actually. Um, well, the Warcraft, um, they're looking at the potential to produce figures from their particular game. And this company, Freedom of Creation, um, their products are made by 3D printing. You can go online and you can buy them. And they are produced by a process where you design it on the screen, and you go file, print, and a product is produced. Again, I'm simplifying it slightly because there are other processes involved. But that's the direction that we're going in. That it will change the way, it will change some established business models. Uh, in the same way it changed the, the music industry, information industry. Um, I've got three diagrammatic slides now, but I wanted to put those in because some people say, well, what's, what's the case for business investing in this technology? So I've got three slides that try to summarise some of this up. And the first one is the ability to change, the ability to change your mind. In a normal given design process here, um, where essentially we start off with developing some ideas, and we develop some concept ideas, and eventually we detail them up, we produce them and we sell them. A very crude sort of design process. But I know working in that, in working in R&D, that if I, the more I get down the design chain, the more I start to commit to expensive tooling, and the customer says, ah, "I don't want it that big. I'd like it that big." It becomes very expensive for me to change my mind. But if I can produce a component, a prototype, much earlier in the design stage, to get the feedback either from the customer, either from the person that's got to assemble it either from the person that's got to stick it in a box and stick it on a shelf and distribute it. I need all that valuable information as soon as I can, much earlier in the design process, because it's a lot less expensive for me to change my mind, for, for me to make a change. So these tools really help in testing the idea early on in the design process. I'm sorry about this particular one, it's a bit messy, but what essentially I'm trying to say here is if you took the cost of any particular product, um, a consumer item, um, a piece of furniture, etc. A lot of the cost is tied up in materials. A lot of the cost is tied up in labour and overhead. But the design department, its cost is probably only about 5%. And a lot of people have poured over these numbers because what they're trying to say is that if you get the design right, you've got to get the design right. And what they're saying is that the biggest influence on cost is design. Okay? And it's been the tradition of, of many British manufacturers.